One of the goals of the course is to at least try to get students to recognize the difference between a distinction that you made on the, the person and the situation. So if we start with the person, um, can you tell us what uh, personality factors or uh, how they differ from situational factors and, and, and what, what that difference is? Well, uh, as lay psychologists, as ordinary people walking around, when we're asked to explain events or account for behavior, we uh, characteristically cite things about the actor, the actor's personality. So we talk about some people who are brave and some people who are cowardly or some people who are adventurous or others who are shy. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we normally think about things. But there's an interesting uh, research tradition in psychology which showed that if you expose people to situations, usually novel situations under well-controlled circumstances and to some extent even if you observe them in their day-to-day -day life, uh, the degree of cross-situational consistency in behavior is relatively low. The people who are kind of boisterous and loud in the dining hall aren't necessarily the people who are outgoing at parties mm -hmm. and uh, or the people who uh, are willing to put up their hand in class. Mm -hmm. And that was an observation that was made by Walter Michel in a very famous book almost 50 years ago. Mm. And uh, one of the things that uh, Dick Nisbet and I began to write about was the, uh, the way in which getting straight about the power of the situation versus the power or predictive power of individual differences mm -hmm. uh, was something about which uh, people commonly had some illusions or errors. I might say that that's partially because in everyday life, the person and the situation are usually deeply confounded. Mm. We don't just see people responding uh, to a situation. We see people who have, uh, who occupy particular roles, have particular relationships. And so when we see a, be, a person behaving in ways that are predictable to us or consistent, it may have as much to do with the consistency of the situations that are impinging on that individual and the kind of commitments they've made uh, as it does with some kind of internal uh, character or internal traits. Yeah. So this idea of an internal character or internal mm -hmm. traits really seems compelling. I mean, mm -hmm. from, I think probably from most people would think, I mean, when you're explaining that um, uh, somebody's laid back or honest mm -hmm. or something. I mean, it feels like that that's valuable. It is very predictive of future sorts of situations. So if I describe you as an honest person, I'd expect you to be honest across a whole bunch of different situations. And you're saying that that's not the case. Well, I'm saying that uh, the research that was done in the case of honesty that looked at people in different situations who who might cheat on an exam, who would take more candy than their share from the table, who would uh, uh, perhaps uh, lie, uh, that it just turned out that the degree of predictability was relatively low. I mean, the correlation, if you want a number, is around, it's usually around 0.15. Mm -hmm. But uh, part of the uh, illusion, however, as I said, uh, arises from the fact that as we experience people in our lives, uh, we see a much more predictability in that. So uh, the people who I deal with and I find honest, first of all, they're honest with me. So I'm part of the situation and I'm always there in their dealings with me. Yeah. Secondly, they may be honest uh, because they care about their reputation and that may be a factor in all kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. We like to joke in that if we took, uh, let's say, a, a devout uh, parson and a uh, kind of low-life gambler and we uh, exchanged their roles. We put the white collar on one guy and had him in church and meeting with his parishioners and the other guy out frequenting low haunts as the sociologists like to say. Yeah. We might find that the uh, the guy who has a great reputation for probity 
uh, cuts loose a little bit, and the guy who's seen as a uh, somewhat sketchy character now suddenly seems uh, pious and uh, yeah. uh, consistently honest and restrained. Interesting. Uh, so you mentioned the, uh, the, I think it's the Hartshorn and May uh, study on honesty. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about uh, that experiment and exactly what they did? Well, I have to try and remember, but the <laughs> or main, just more the, generally with relation. But with the main thing is they observed uh, kids mm -hmm. in uh, more than one situation, and then they looked at the extent to which the kids who showed relatively honest behavior in one situation mm -hmm. showed relatively honest behavior in other situations. Yeah. And there is a distinction between reliability and consistency. So reliability would be: does the same person do the same thing in the same situation the next time that you see him. And uh, cross-situational consistency would involve uh, the question of whether the person who exhibits a particular trait or a particular characteristic in one situation seems to show the same characteristics in another situation that, uh, by the way we think about things, should be tapping the same traits. Yep. Interesting. So little Susie on the playground, uh, you know, acting up, mm -hmm. um, may not act up in every situation. But right. It, you mentioned um, predicting behavior in extreme situations. Mm -hmm. um, would that hold? I mean, why is, why is extreme behaviors uh, better predictors than just kind of average behaviors? Well, we're going to get into some boring statistics if That's we go right. very far with this, yep. but uh, if we see something really extreme, it's likely to be someone who shows more of a given characteristic. This is clearest in sports. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, if you observe people uh, uh, jogging on the playground, uh, you, uh, you might find that the one person jogs faster one day, the other person jogs faster the next day. Uh, but if it's the uh, Olympics and they're going for a gold medal and you're giving them the most extreme challenge, it's going to be a very, very fast runner mm. who wins. And uh, we can talk about the same thing if we were going to look for who would uh, do something that was particularly pro-social. It's going to be someone who has uh, a deep concern and a history, even though in less taxing situations and more characteristic ones, uh, we may not be able to predict who's going to uh, give the panhandler a $5 bill or uh, who's going to uh, uh, bring their old clothes to the food, to the uh, Salvation Army Center, that kind of thing. Yep. While, we're, while we're talking about this dispositionism, yep. uh, one of the things that's worth noting mm -hmm. is that in our culture, it's kind of overdetermined. Mm -hmm. So we get this tendency to overestimate the impact of the situation, in part because we observe people in the same situations most of the time, uh, in part just because when we see someone act, we focus on the actor, right. not on the situation. In our particular culture, it's a, almost a theory that people are, of, are responsible for their behavior. Right. Uh, we don't look kindly on people who are fair weather friends or who adjust their, trim the sa their behavior to the sail, sure. to the prevailing winds, we would say. But also, even our language predisposes us. You notice we talk about an honest person, but we don't have a term for a situation that prompts honesty. Hmm. We, you know, if we have to say, well, this is the kind of situation in which the average person is honest mm -hmm. and uh, uh, only very dishonest people will be dishonest in this situation or it's a kind of situation in which most people take some liberties but only the most extremely honest people can be counted on, we have to engage in this very complicated language. But we can say, this is an honest person, and that's a shorthand for saying something about what we expect the actor to do across the situations. And we can say that. How would you, how would you characterize a situation in which you expect most people to be brave? Yep. We literally don't have a word. Mm -hmm. Now, it isn't that we can't conceive of such a thing. We do have one domain, one that we care about a great deal in our culture, where we do have that. Uh, when we talk about a test, we can say the test is easy or hard. 
and that's a really useful shorthand for saying we expect most people to do well at it or only exceptionally able people to do well at it uh, and that kind of thing. We also have it for emotion words so we can talk about a scary movie or a sexy poster or things like that that again have that property that they're telling us what to expect from the average person. But it's interesting that we don't have these terms when it pertains to what we normally think of as personality traits. So why do you think that is? It seems like a bit of a chicken and the egg problem, doesn't it? I mean, why is it so compelling if it's so not predictive? Why is personality explanations of, of saying that, uh, that uh, Johnny's honest or laid back or something? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it isn't, well, if, most if we of the, have a correlation uh, of about point, point 0.15, as you said, I mean, that's not going to get us very far. So why do we stick with it? Well, because most of the time we're not given the task of predicting the behavior of a bunch of people in a novel situation. Uh, most of the time we're looking at people behaving in contexts in which we've observed them often, in which they have reputations and relationships. So when you say mom is... Uh, I know mom is going to have uh, hot apple pie uh, when I come to visit from, uh, from my, uh, where, I'm, where I'm living or working now. Uh, that's very predictable, but it's not predictable just because your mom has a disposition to make apple pies. It's that she always makes an apple pie when you come to visit. So the experience of consistency within situations gives rise to the impression that it's reflective of, of uh, character or traits. What we care about uh, as lay psychologists is knowing the people in our world. And uh, we're kind of motivated to see them as consistent uh, and coherent. Hmm. And, and even basic perception, after all, when an act occurs, we focus on the act and the actor commits the act. They're a unit. We see them together. We don't see the actor and the situation together uh, normally. So it's kind of overdetermined. Sure. You mentioned that uh, in your book that there doesn't seem to be many sort of landmark studies on, on personality like there is with uh, the situation. So we know of some very compelling demonstrations mm -hmm. of the power of the situation that, that don't seem to occur in demonstrations of the power of personality. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit about uh, some of those demonstrations for the situation? Well, let's first say, uh, when we say that, it's given that we expect a great deal of consistency uh, in behavior of people across situations, it's very hard to do a study that shows that there's even more consistency than we imagined. Mm. Uh, by contrast, since we expect and think we know people well, it's easy to design a study in which we use the various tricks and insights of social psychologists and create a situation in which ordinary people behave in ways that we think are extraordinary, extraordinarily altruistic or extraordinarily cowardly or extraordinarily uh, uh, foolish and, and, and the like. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is, ironically, one set of studies on uh, consistency of behavior that are pretty impressive. And they were ironically done by the same guy, Walter Michel, who had done the early studies showing lack of consistency in behavior. And what he showed is that the degree to which people seem able to resist temptation, the extent to which uh, uh, people seem to have a degree of uh, self-control and the ability to delay gratification, and he showed that the behavior of children that in the nursery school uh, predicted uh, rather well things like uh, their success in getting into college and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there are some, some exceptions. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, social psychology uh, has produced a whole series of classic experiments, the point of which is to show that when we manipulate the situation or we produce particular kinds of situations, we see behavior which uh, defies our intuitions, which surprises us.
One of the channel factors that I find interesting is this idea of, of organ donation. And it's such a simple, tiny manipulation of, uh, seemingly tiny manipulation of um, opting in or opting out of, mm -hmm. of organ donation. Is that, do you know the details or? Well, um, uh, I, uh, I know as much about it as most social psychologists who've read the study and thought yeah. about it. Uh, for many of us, it's a very powerful uh, demonstration of what Kurt Levine called uh, a channel factor. That is something that made it a little easier to act in a accord with your, uh, with your preferences or your values. But uh, I think there was a, a many, many interesting features in that. But the starting point is just that this is a case of what we would, might call a natural experiment. It wasn't a study in which someone manipulated this, although uh, people have followed up on it, yeah. including me <laughs> and uh, my colleagues. Uh, but uh, the finding, as I think uh, most people in psychology are aware now, is that if you looked at European countries, and some of those countries had a policy where you had to sign the back of your license, your driver's license to make you a potential organ donor. In other places, you had to sign if you didn't want to be a potential organ donor. So the phenomena was incredibly dramatic. I mean, you found countries as similar as Austria and Germany or Norway and uh, Sweden uh, having tremendously different rates, uh, under 10% of people in some cases and over 95 and others, very, very dramatic. So it's tempting. A lot of people look at that and say, well, just people are lazy. Yeah. But it was subtler than that. The institutional arrangements that exist communicate norms. So Tom Gilovich and I uh, did a study uh, that, that uh, was published in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in which we showed that the meaning of that act changed. So in uh, countries where you had to sign your driver's license to be a potential donor, it was seen as something akin to leaving a lot of money uh, in your will to a particular charity. In the uh, cases of the opt-out countries, it was seen as something very modest, uh, like letting other people uh, ahead of you in line if they were in a hurry. So okay. we, yeah. that was a maybe the lesson of social psychology that's second only to the one about the power of the situation is how important the uh, meaning or uh, the connotations of the situation are to the actor and the extent to which we have to know what the actor means, what the situation means to the actor if we want to be able to predict and understand that behavior. And it, it's very interesting to think about what happens when all we know about someone is that they signed their license, uh, the back of their license in such a way that uh, made them a potential donor or not. Uh, we, we're likely to think it's telling us something deep about their character and unlikely to appreciate the extent to which in both cases, they're just doing what they think ordinary citizens do. And in one case, they think only extreme altruists who don't care about how they desecrate their body after they die might sign up. Whereas in the other, they think it's a normal duty of good citizenship and only misanthropes and bad citizens would refuse. Yeah. Given what we know about uh, kind of the weakness of personality factors and, and the strength of situational factors, uh, if I were uh, an employer and hiring a new employee in my company, what sort of advice would you have then for uh, what would be the most predictive of their future behavior? Well, uh, obviously if you had evidence about how they've behaved in very, very similar situations in the past, that would be useful. But my advice to a, uh, an employer would be to create the kind of context, the kind of comp corporate norms and reinforce them uh, in such a way that they um, produce the kinds of behavior uh, that you want. That is to say, I'd try hard to model that kind of behavior. I would celebrate it when I saw it. I would uh, 
respond immediately to behavior that was inconsistent with what I wanted. Uh, we see this uh, in the area that I work in conflict resolution. There's often a feeling that you have to find the right guy to make a deal with. And uh, the evidence uh, that we find is that the same, uh, the same person who might be a terrorist at one point in time can become a heroic uh, peace fighter at another period of time. This was true in the work we've done in Northern Ireland where we looked at uh, ex-bombers who became peace activists and to some extent it's true even in the life of Nelson Mandela. And so uh, lots of times people say we're looking for a Mandela on the other side when what they should be doing is how can we create a context that creates a Mandela mm -hmm. on the other side. So this idea of channel factors um, that you mentioned with respect to the Milgram experiment and others, um, it's extremely powerful. I mean, it, it's, and I think it, people aren't really kind of taking advantage of it as far as um, in the Occupy movement or in climate change and so on. In, in trying to motivate a large number of people to do one particular thing, they don't really seem to be taking advantage of of the situation as much as they could. Is that, is that well, true? Well, uh, I think uh, the message has started to uh, become much better understood, uh, actually. Uh, we're seeing in education a number of uh, really dramatic cases where relatively small changes in the situation facing students, uh, just giving messages about whether they belong and whether the institution has confidence that they can succeed. And we see big effects of these kinds of manipulations. Certainly politicians have gotten the message. Uh, to some extent it's been negative in the sense that they no longer worry about persuading people. They just say, how can we identify the folks who are likely to be our voters and make them get to the polls? It was interesting in the last election, I don't think it's a big secret that uh, Barack Obama uh, had the assistance of a number of behavioral psychologists and behavioral economists and uh, who used uh, a number of different uh, techniques to initially identify and then make sure their voters would actually get to the polls. They did this in in very, very sophisticated ways, such that uh, on the night of the election, uh, the Republican strategists were uh, shocked and were convinced that the prediction models uh, were, uh, that they had were correct and the early polling was wrong because they were saying, given everything we know about the economy and given what we know about popularity ratings and given what we know about the frequency with which particular ethnic or demographic groups vote, what's going to happen? And what they didn't realize was that an experimental manipulation had been done. Some very, very clever and powerful techniques had been used to make people who were favorably leading but not likely voters to actually vote. And what were those? What did they do? Ah, uh, <laughs> that's a secret. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, if you read the history of social psychology, you'd be able to predict. I mean, I could imagine a couple of them. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, one is getting early commitment, getting people who say they're going to vote. Uh, you say, "Can we count on you? Yep. Uh, can we call you back on election day and make sure you voted?" Or in getting them to register. Uh, instead of saying, will you go register, you say, okay, let's do it right now. Take out your cell phone and make this call and someone will come and pick you up. I mean, there's many, many things yeah. that you can do. But the point was to, uh, to make sure that people who generally were disposed to behave in a particular way, uh, but often in history have not done so, in this case, they would and they could be counted on. Can you tell us about uh, the fundamental attribution error? Just what it is, and um, and what we can what we can tell about human behavior on the basis of it. Okay. Well, the term the fundamental attribution error has a kind of strange and interesting history, and it's led to some confusion. So the first time 
that I used the term, and I think I was the one who coined it, it came when uh, Dick Nisbet, who I know you've interviewed, had done a very important series of studies and written a paper with Ned Jones on actor-observer differences. And when he had showed it to me, I said, well, that's really interesting, Dick, but the fundamental thing is that people overestimate the uh, degree of cross-situational consistency and they make trait attributions in general when they shouldn't. Uh, then uh, in a later paper when I was discussing various kinds of errors and biases, in distinguishing my work from what I thought was the central message of social psychology, I had said, well, the fundamental error is the tendency to underestimate the impact of the situation. And what I meant by that was it, not that it was fundamental in the sense that it was irreducible. Uh, no, what I meant is it was an error in the most fundamental task that we uh, attempt in life, which is to say, what does that situation tell me about the actor? What does that situation tell me about the observer? And the, uh, the, the term fundamental attribution error referred to the fact that people characteristically make an error in that fundamental task. But uh, that isn't the fundamental failing that human beings have. The fundamental failing that, that really is much more basic is the tendency to assume that the way we see the world is the way the world really is. That other reasonable people should see it the same way and if they don't see it the same way it's because there's something wrong with them. Some bias that's affecting them. It can be their, the propaganda to which they've been exposed. It can be some uh, failing in their intelligent. Uh, it can be something about their education but we readily think that when people disagree with us, it's because there's something wrong with them, not something wrong with us, or at least not something that's affecting both of us mm -hmm. that's making us simply disagree. Interesting. There was another uh, term that you used a fair bit kind of early on as well, and uh, naive realism. Can you tell us uh, about the, the, the notion of naive realism? Well, I, that's what I just yeah. described, uh, was yeah. uh, naive realism. And we said naive realism in that uh, human beings necessarily think that the world is the way they perceive it to be. Uh, if I look around this uh, campus, I see uh, uh, walls and uh, windows and grass, and uh, to me, that is the way the world is. Uh, Einstein memorably said, reality is an illusion, and what he meant by that is that uh, what we experience in reality is kind of the, the interaction that occurs between the kind of stardust that we're made of and the kind of stardust that's out there. And that to a physicist, the world is uh, made up of these infinitesimally tiny strings of matter and energy fields, nothing like the way we perceive it to be. That's, that's uh, what we perceive as reality, is our way of responding to that uh, input and that construction. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, of course, uh, we have to assume that the world is the way we perceive it, and in many ways we perceive the world similarly, and it serves us really well to believe that, this naive belief that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the way we perceive things and the way they really are. But it can get us into trouble, particularly when other people come to that world with different histories, uh, different needs, different goals, different biases, different experiences. Related to that, you had a student. Um, you had a student in, I think, 1990, uh, Elizabeth Newton, right, who did a, a tapping experiment. Uh, can you tell us about that? Well, uh, I must say, uh, the real author of that study was my brother, who was a musician. <laughs> really? <laughs> and he, he used to do this when I was a kid. Yes. And he showed me uh, this interesting phenomena that if you tap out a tune, you think you know for sure what it is. It seems really obvious to you. Uh, and in part, that's because when you're tapping the tune, you hear the music that accompanies it. And you know when you're not tapping whether that's a musical rest or a sustained note. Uh, this is something you only can appreciate by trying it, but I would urge anyone uh, seeing the series to try it on, on someone. Tap some really familiar song, you know, 
Uh, you can tap the national anthem or you can tap uh, jingle bells or something really familiar. And to you, it'll seem absolutely inevitable that the other person will know and they'll look at you with a, a, a kind of blank look. So when Elizabeth Newton came along, I had described this phenomenon to her, and she said, oh, that's great, let's make a study of it, and it became part of her dissertation. That's outstanding. And there are other things uh, like that. If when you know it, when you've done something very often and it's become easy to you, you are surprised that it isn't easy to someone else. They ought to know, uh, they ought to know the right answer. Yes. Uh, it even pertains to uh, information. You know, the, the books you've read, you think most other educated people have surely read that. Uh, and when someone tells you what a book you don't know, you say, my, they must be really deeply educated or have this esoteric interest. There is this uh, overwhelming uh, tendency to, to feel that not just the way we see the world, but uh, the way we respond to the world, our priorities, the things we find easy, the things we find difficult, will be shared by other people. That's called the false consensus effect. Well, and the false consensus effect follows from naive realism. This can get boring when we start going fine. through all these yeah. definitions, yeah, sure. but the false consensus effect just refers to the fact that all things being equal, uh, people who behave in a particular way are more likely to think that other people will behave in that way than people who behave in a different way. So it follows off from the naive realism, but that seems to yes. go all the way down, doesn't it? As far, right. as, as far as basic perception, the light waves that hit the back of the retina. Right. And, yeah. uh, we initially assume that other people will respond the same way, as yeah. way we do. When they do, we're not surprised, but when they don't, we think the thing to be understood or explained is why they responded the way they did rather than why we responded the way we did. But you're absolutely right. It pertains to everything from basic perception yep. uh, to the kinds of political and social judgments we make about what our political priorities are, how important it is to help disadvantaged people versus uh, provide uh, a good climate for entrepreneurs. Hmm. Uh, even in those domains, the way we see it seems to us to be the right way to see it. Yeah. And we sometimes even can understand why other people see it that way. So in work on conflict resolution that I've done, uh, Israeli military leaders are perfectly willing to concede that if they had been born Palestinians, they might be uh, Palestinian terrorists or freedom fighters, depending on how you want to label it, yeah. and vice versa. By that, they don't mean that the other person is right is just as right or righteous as they are, but they believe that had they been in that other context, they would have been misled the same way the other person was misled. So the title of the course is The Science of Everyday Thinking. Um, what advice do you have uh, for the students who are taking the course to improve the way that they think every day? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think paying attention to the message of Danny Kahneman's book uh, is a starting point, and that is uh, there are many, many sources of error or bias that we learn about uh, in psychology. Uh, we also learn about some things that people do really well uh, and quickly, and we tend not to study those uh, enough. So the message is when we're doing one of the tasks that we know that people uh, have difficulty with or are subject to particular biases, just take a little time, mm -hmm. uh, reconsider it. Uh, uh, the equivalent to uh, not pressing the send button when you've, when you've uh, written a message that you're not sure about, uh, it's a good idea just to uh, stop and take a little time and reflect. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, ask someone else, uh, how does this seem when you experience it not as an actor but as an observer? How would you respond if you received it? Uh, sometimes, very importantly, just uh, thinking about the difference between the experience we have as an actor and an observer. And I'll give you an example. Most people I know would say that they rarely, if ever, have deliberately given offense to another person that they've deliberately tried to hurt the feelings of another person. Mm -hmm. 
most of us as uh, observers, or at least as the targets of action, can think of lots of cases where people said things to us that were hurtful or painful. Uh, and so the message is, when you're a, an actor, uh, stop and think. Uh, has that kind of thing ever made you uh, unhappy or uncomfortable? Okay. Conversely, when you are the target, say, well, when uh, you've said or done that kind of thing, did you intend to, to be hurtful or do harm? So shifting that actor and observer perspective, as well as taking a little bit of time, yeah. uh, can, uh, can save you a lot of pain and uh, misunderstanding in interpersonal settings. So it seems like put yourself in the shoes of others uh, when kind of considering... Well, I hate, I, I hate <laughs> what my students sometimes call moccasin and eyewear metaphors. It isn't so much a matter of putting yourself in that other situation. I don't think in the other person's shoes. I don't think... I think that's a metaphor. Sure. But you can uh, essentially say, what has my own experience been when I was in that situation? That's an important distinction. Yeah. yeah. Social psychology is, is with kind of the things like Blink and Danny Kahneman's book um, seems to be pretty hot at the moment. Do you have, what, what do you think is kind of the most interesting and, and uh, worthy things to be kind of pursuing at the moment in social okay. psychology? Well, there's two answers, two kinds of answers to that question. So one is what's changing in social psychology? And I think what's changing is that we're increasingly getting beyond the uh, laboratory classic social psychology experiment where you take people, expose them for a short period of time to something novel and see what they do. Increasingly, we're getting interested in the kind of behavior that occurs in familiar contexts where people know each other and have an existing uh, role in institutional relationships, and we see behavior unfold over time mm -hmm. in ways that have cumulative consequences. Uh, much more interest in natural experiments that occur where different people, different institutions do things in different ways and looking at what we can learn from those. So that's a change that I think is occurring in the field for someone like me a little bit sadly that the, uh, the kind of experiment the kind of experimental tradition that I grew up with, I think, has passed its uh, has passed its noon and is yeah. nearing its uh, <laughs> nearing its night. Uh, but in terms of uh, the content of psychology, and it's not just social psychology. What has become increasingly obvious and important is the extent to which uh, we're influenced by uh, uh, processes that are implicit, that we don't have conscious access to. So to some extent, uh, we are rediscovering, if not the unconscious, then the non-conscious. And we're really getting impressed by how much cognitive work, how much reasoning, how much learning occurs in contexts where we're not aware of the fact that we're doing it, how much we're influenced by things that we're not aware of and uh, the work of John Barge and others uh, on uh, priming, uh, I think, are having a kind of transformative effect on the field. The area is quite new, and we're making mistakes, and we're over, we're sometimes uh, showing what Shakespeare calls vaunting ambition that overleaps itself uh, in this area, but there's no doubt that that's going to that beast is going to get tamed, and it's going to be a fairly important uh, uh, and central feature of psychology in future. It's going to be, in some ways, rediscovering what Freud was interested in, the importance of non-conscious processes. But whereas Freud thought that this was something that happened because of primarily for motivational reasons and protecting the ego or, uh, or the like, uh, we're now discovering there's nothing that exotic about it. It's simply that the focus of attention is very narrow and the amount of information we're inputting at any one point in time uh, is enormous. Hmm. So we're teaching this course, uh, The Science of Everyday Thinking, Think 101. We have hundreds of thousands of students across the planet who are mm -hmm. taking it. Um, do you have any advice for us 
Uh, obviously, there have been several attempts before to kind of improve people's thinking, to make them less prone to superstition and so on, that, have, that haven't succeeded very well. Um, I know you and Dick have written uh, before about, for example, ways of trying to get people to think, make better decisions, think better, do better. Uh, do you have any advice for us on how we might succeed? Well, uh, it's ironic. I just, uh, I've used the word ironic several times, I realize, but there's a lot of ironic things in psychology. <laughs> uh, just as I said that the experiment, the classic experiment, is kind of fading yeah. uh, and it's important, I think its role in education is absolutely central. And I mm. think that uh, much of the most important research we ever did and described really uh, consisted of demonstration experiments. They didn't make some huge theoretical uh, point that was very, very specific. They demonstrated to us not what must happen, but what can happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that in education, uh, we learn through experience. And so uh, having someone see for themselves uh, to experience for themselves the kinds of things that we've typically had people do in laboratory studies uh, can be uh, very useful. So we talked about the Milgram experiment, which is very controversial. Uh, I'm not sure I would try and put every student through the Milgram experiment, but having uh, the experience of being in a powerful role versus being in a powerless role mm -hmm. and showing how that changes the way you think and the way you feel. Uh, many years ago, I did a study in which we had some people ask difficult general knowledge questions that they came up with to another person. Mm -hmm. And the person answering those questions thought that the person asking them was much more knowledgeable than they were. Uh, and they were very impressed by that person. Uh, when we switched roles, we got the opposite experience. So coming to be aware of the way in which our position uh, of power or lack of power, uh, having a particular motive or not having a particular motive, the experience of seeing how that influences us mm -hmm. is uh, a, a powerful one. Mm -hmm. And so I would say don't omit the possibility of having people. When I talked about the tapping study, yeah. uh, we can describe it, but it's nowhere near as good as simply uh, yeah. Uh, doing the experiment for yourself. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I would say uh, build in lots of opportunities for people to have yeah. the kinds of experiences that you're trying to teach them about. Interesting. At, at the end of Human Inference, which you and Dick wrote uh, in 1980, you had a, a few slogans, a few maxims, <laughs> which I thought was quite clever and, and really quite good. I think we call them fortune cookie fortune, didactic. That's right, that's right. So uh, to remind you, a couple of them uh, were, uh, it's an empirical question, or what do the other three cells look like? Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about others that you might have included <laughs> since then? Or? Well, I think that's what Dick Nisbet's book is, yeah. is about, the new book that he's uh, working on, mm -hmm. is what are the most useful insights uh, you can have. Uh, You're working on a new book. What is, what's that book about at the moment? You, it's well, the new book that we're working on is called, has a very similar goal to your course. Yeah. It's called The Wisest in the Room. And we're saying what have been the most uh, powerful and useful insights in social psychology and how can they be used not so much to uh, get what you want in life, but to do a better job of understanding what's going on around you, what's going around on in your family, yeah. what's going on. Uh, in your workplace, what's going on uh, politically in your uh, in your community or in the larger world? Hmm. Interesting. So uh, yeah. On the didactics, yeah. do you have any any kind of nuggets of insight that 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 students might be able to use? At least I, I, I particularly like we're talking in the course about checklist diagrams and what mm -hmm. do the other three cells look like. Um, uh, well, one uh, would, I would borrow from Solomon Ash from 50 years ago, and that is when someone behaves in a way that surprises you, when someone makes a judgment or assessment that seems surprising 
consider the possibility that what you were wrong about was not their judgment of the object, but what the object of judgment was. That is to say, if someone behaves in ways that are surprising to you, take seriously the possibility that you're wrong about what the situation meant to that other person. And that will help you do a better job if you're trying to influence people. If you're trying to influence people and it isn't working, yeah. it may be because the thing you're doing is being understood very differently by the other person that what you, than what you intend. So pay attention to, mm -hmm. the possibil to, the, to what the, ob uh, the object of judgment is, or at least what the actor's construal of the object of judgment. Uh, when I uh, pay my children for doing well in school, am I, is that a bonus yeah. or is it a bribe? Yeah. If it's a bonus, it's wonderful. Yeah. If it's a bribe, uh, then the message is, when the bribe is there, do it. When the bribe isn't there, don't do it. Yeah. If it's a bonus, it's great. Uh, isn't the world a wonderful place? When you do the right thing, good things happen to you. Yeah. My name is Lee. I think about wisdom. Mm -hmm.